Okay, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I am talking about diabetes. And the question is, is diabetes a gut bacterial illness? And surprisingly, even though this data has been around for at least 10 years, uh, very solid in the last five to six years, it still is not permeated out to mainstream culture as much as I would hope that it would be. Um, many of you who watch TV, gosh, even those of us who watch YouTube or are on Facebook, we're constantly being inundated with ads for diabetes medications. And you may be familiar with them, you know, some of them like Genuvia and some of the newer Invokana type medications, um, you're going to see a lot of advertisements for them. Diabetes is an illness that is exploding in terms of prevalence. Approximately 10% of the po population here in America now has diabetes. Approximately one third of the American population is pre-diabetic. And the longer someone is pre-diabetic, the more likely they are to develop diabetes. So we have this huge wave of like a third of our population who potentially now could develop diabetes and already 10% of our population has diabetes. So if we don't do something as a society, this problem is just gonna grow and grow and grow. And the travesty of it is that when we have type two diabetes, that's specifically what I'm talking about tonight. I should have said it is type two diabetes, a gut bacterial illness. Actually type one is thought to be as well. I could do a whole nother broadcast on that. But that aside, you have this issue of diabetes. It predisposes you to so many other factors, and so does obesity. It increases your chance of heart disease, strokes, cancer. A lot of people are not aware of the link to cancer, but uh, the higher your body mass index is, if you're obese, then your chances of developing cancer are much, much higher. So this is a really, really important topic, and unfortunately, it's ubiquitous, meaning it's so common that because it's common, I think that people don't take it as serious as they should. If you can, try to go into your memory and think of some of those pictures they've shown from the World War I era, or more specifically, the World War II era, when people were coming out of the Great Depression, at that time, the American population was very thin. People were fighting to have food to eat. I know talking to my relatives who lived through that period, you know, they, it, was, it was very difficult. They lived off the land. And you can see that in, if you look up you know, pictures of soldiers going into World War II. We were a thinner population. Fast forward, however many years that is, I guess around 80 years, we've lived in a time of abundance and the golden era of America and and things becoming easier, so to speak, in terms of prepackaged foods, fast food. Uh, you know, we have a society of convenience, the mass production of different crops like corn and soy and wheat um, have now facilitated a very calorie rich diet that is high in saturated fats, high in simple carbohydrates that taste really good and they're readily available. So those living in the depression era didn't have access to Taco Bell. They didn't have access to a Big Mac at McDonald's, not knocking Big Macs. But that type of food was not around. It's not to say they didn't eat fatty foods at times or, or high carb foods at times, but just the landscape has changed. So just kind of have that knowledge base um, going into this talk. I first became aware of this connection between diabetes and metabolic syndrome and prediabetes and, and gut bacterial connections probably around 2013. Clearly it was being discussed before then, but 2013 is really when I started looking at this issue. <clears throat> and the data from then till now gets more and more definitive that Diabetes is a gut bacterial illness, and I'll go through a few articles between now and then uh, by the end of the broadcast. Also ask your question, and you can probably Google this, what is the one cure 
for diabetes. And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to say it's not a medication. It's not a diet per se. I will say that I've seen dietary changes and supplementation have profound effects on type 2 diabetes. But when you look through the literature, the one recognizable cure, and cure is a strong word, for type 2 diabetes is the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. And in that procedure, which is not as commonly done in the gastric bypass world, is where they cut out the small intestines. And they cut out the first part of the small intestine, if I remember correctly. And in doing so, what they found were these immediate sharp reductions in, in blood sugar in these patients. And they couldn't explain it based on a caloric deficit model, meaning you have a gastric bypass, what's the idea? So your stomach is smaller, you can't eat as much, you're having less calories. So because of that, you're not going to gain weight, you're going to lose weight and diabetes and things like that will come into control. When they looked at these studies, they found that when they did the gastric bypass, cutting out the small intestine or pieces of the small intestine, that the liver was no longer seeming to be poisoned. Hormones shifted radically when they did this procedure such that then all of a sudden insulin function came back online and it's like the diabetes type 2 went away and a lot of the subjects. So again, pardon the pun, food for thought. Now I was digging through the articles for a great image, so to speak, and I found one, but then it wasn't something that was open to display on something like YouTube or Facebook, so I couldn't put it on there. But I'm going to be using a few terms that may be new. Lipopolysaccharide, abbreviated as LPS. LPS represents pieces of gram-negative bacteria in the intestines. Take a step further. If you've ever taken further back. If you've ever taken microbiology, you may have learned about gram positive and gram negative. It's basically just the gram stain and certain bacteria look a certain way and another group of bacteria look a different way. Gram negative bacteria tend to have these little fingers on them. And these fingers are referred to as lipopolysaccharide, LPS. If you have too much of these pieces of bacteria, drifting around in your body, it induces endotoxemia. What does that sound like? It sounds like you're toxic, right? Or subclinical endotoxemia. So you can have pieces of these bacteria floating around in your bloodstream at too high of a level, but it's not enough to induce a huge fever and for you to have a near-death event or possibly die from it. If you remember back to the lye tampon scare, what was happening was is that these lye tampons were growing certain populations of gram-negative bacteria that had lipopolysaccharide on them. And in doing so, then the lipopolysaccharide went from that area of the anatomy to the systemic circulation, which resulted in endotoxemia. And quite a few people did not do so well um, when that was happening. So they figured it out from a microbiology standpoint, but toxic shock, as it's referred to, is very, very serious. What we're seeing in metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, diabetes, is that there are higher levels of lipopolysaccharide, as you see here in the title, floating around than there should be. And so this is a widely known fact. I just put this article up here because it's relatively recent and they if you look at the abstract, increased blood lipopolysaccharide or free fatty acid, which I'm going to come back to, correlate with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. The purpose of the present study was to evaluate the interactive effect of serum LPS and FFA levels on the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So basically they're saying this is what's known in the literature and we're going to try and confirm it. And this is from the Journal of Diabetes Investigation. I think this was published in 2020. Oh, no, maybe 2019 but very recent. And in this article, they go on to say, um, basically confirm what they thought. It was around 2,500 uh, people within China where they did the study. But they said a low-grade inflammation in obesity is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes, and inflammation contributes to the path pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes through the induction of insulin resistance. So what does that all mean? Well, your gastrointestinal tract, encompassing everything from your mouth down to your anus, 
particularly important here is your small intestines and your colon. Within your small intestine and your colon, you have 37 trillion gut bacteria. That's the estimate. You have approximately 30 trillion cells in your body. It's thought that there are around 37 trillion gastrointestinal bacteria. That's a lot of bacteria. It's literally pounds of bacteria. And so these bacteria, when they have excessive, if you have excessive LPS, uh, bacteria, so to speak, or excessive populations of gram-negative bacteria, well then pieces of them are going to break off, and where do they go? Some are going to go into your stool, some are going to go into your bloodstream. Because your intestines and colon are, for all intents and purposes, just a tube. And what's separating that tube, the inner contents, from the outer portion of the tube is basically one cell layer thick of skin. So our skin out here is, has several layers to it. The intestinal lining and in colon is just one cell layer thick of skin and then you have some other mucosal layers and you have nerve plexuses that help to move the contents through and we have all these different secretions but it's not a really dense you know thick in diameter outer core to our intestinal lining. It's, it's very fluid and that allows us to absorb what we're eating and what we're drinking and vitamins and things of that nature, but it also makes us very susceptible now that the human microbiome is radically shifting for so many. You know, just based on those statistics, if we're talking about obesity, well, let's just say it this way. So one third of the American population is overweight. One third of the population is obese. So that's two thirds of the people walking around in America technically perhaps have a microbiome problem. As I mentioned, one third of the population is pre-diabetic. 10% of the population is diabetic. So that's 40% right there who have a very legitimate issue with this microbiome. So now we have this seeding effect of lipopolysaccharide. If you think of the intestines as a tube, the seeding effect of LPS coming out of this pipe, so to speak. And where does all that blood go? Well, all that blood goes through what's referred to as the portal circulation. The portal circulation takes the blood to your liver. We have a liver so that we can cleanse what's coming from our gut to hopefully save us if you eat something toxic that your liver can perhaps get rid of it so you pee it out rather than it killing us. So that's important because the liver has a huge effect on blood sugar control through insulin sensitivity. So do your muscles. And what we're finding is that the LPS coming out of the GI tract then seems to impair insulin signaling. It seems to have a radical effect on how sensitive our cells are to insulin. And maybe now that you have this illustration, again, I'm sorry I couldn't find a better um, you know, PowerPoint presentation slide to put up here, but now that you have this, this concept in your head, think of the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass procedure, where now they go in and they cut out this, you can think of it as diseased part of the small intestine. And all of a sudden now the liver gets a break. It's saying, whoa, I'm not being you know, flooded here by lipopolysaccharide. There's no subclinical endotoxemia. Or it's not like it was before. And wow, now I can do my job. Now insulin sensitivity can change. All these different hormones like GLP-1 and incretins can change. Leptin can change. I need to talk about leptin. And all of a sudden blood sugar control comes into regularity. So... That's important. And then this is a really cool article, Journal of Pathology 2018, Increased Jejunal. So you have different portions of your small intestine. You have the duodenum, you have the jejunum, and then the ileum. And so here they're saying increased jejunal permeability and human obesity is revealed by a lipid challenge and is linked to inflammation and type 2 diabetes, simply meaning leaky gut in you, a portion of your small intestine, basically, and they found this out by having people doing a lipid challenge. When we eat lipids, meaning fats, we tend to absorb more pieces of the endotoxin, the LPS. And they found that when they did that, then it's linked to inflammation and type 2 diabetes. This slide is striking. Now, your Intestinal villi, which is this is kind of what they're looking at. Your intestinal villi look like fingers also. So you have finger-like projections. It's like uh, the sea anemones, so to speak, 
when you go down and you're looking at the tide pools, the sea anemones, they have those fingers out there. Why? Because they're trying to absorb things. Well, our intestines have basically these villi, which do the same thing. When people have celiac disease, their villi look like this. They don't have strong finger-like projections coming up to the small intestine so they can absorb things. So that's why celiac patients don't absorb their vitamins nearly as well. So now we have these villi out here. And within these villi, we have its intestinal epithelium, basically. And we have what are referred to as tight junctions within the intestinal epithelia or columnar epithelia of our alimentary canal. So these tight junctions link each epithelial cell together. So when we have leaky gut, that means the tight junctions are opening. So it's like opening up your zipper. And so when that happens, things can pass through. So, so interesting. Here, occludin, NAK, ATPase. So think of occludin, that is a tight junction protein. And just look at this picture versus this picture. Very dramatic. Here, this is a non-obese subject, and look at how much occludin they have. Compare it to someone who's obese, and you're not seeing as much occludin. Occludin is represented in what's immunofluorescing as green. So you're not seeing as much green here as you are over here. So the non-obese subjects have more occludin. They have more tight junction proteins. Same thing with tricellulin. That's another part of the occludin zonulin protein complex. Again, non-obese versus obese. You can see the difference. Pretty dramatic. Even up here, you can see it from the top view, so to speak. Lots of occludin, tricellulin, so to speak. That's what it should look like. So a little disturbing, and what they went on to say, in conclusion, leaky gut. And leaky gut is a terrible word. I don't like the word. I don't like the term, so to speak. It's not the words, two words. I don't like the term because it sounds so demonstrative. You say leaky gut to someone, and they think, oh my gosh, you know, do I have diverticulitis and am I going to die? It's not that severe, so to speak, in terms of life threatening right here, right now. But it is severe in terms of chronic illness, which dramatically can affect your probability of developing heart disease, stroke, cancer, and many other comorbidities, peripheral neuropathy, dementia. So in conclusion, the leaky gut paradigm can be extended to human severe obesity. Although the intestinal barrier dysfunction differs significantly from rodent models, in human obesity, whereas only subtle barrier alterations are evidenced in the fasting state, increased jejunal permeability, intestinal permeability, is unequivocally revealed by a lipid load and is associated with inflammatory and metabolic status. So when they gave these patients a lipid load, then all of a sudden they see unequivocally, that's a strong word, that the leaky gut is demonstrated. These results emphasize the need to consider how re repeated lipid challenges can alter intestinal permeability, blah, blah, blah. They're saying further research needs to be done. But basically, this is significant because now, think about our daily life. Think about a double cheeseburger. Think about what other fatty meals we really like to indulge in. You know, uh, what is it? Fettuccine Alfredo has a lot of fat in it. So these, these lovely components of the American cuisine, which are delicious and they're really high fat, are not necessarily good for leaky gut syndrome, which then raises the question of what is the right diet for type 2 diabetes? And I can't tell you the right diet for all of you. Some people will actually eat a high fat diet, like a ketogenic diet, but because they're starving their body of carbohydrates, they may actually do really well. Other people will do really well with fasting who have diabetes. You know, look at Dr. Fung's work out of Canada, F-U-N-G. Or other people will do really well eating primarily a vegetable-based diet that's really low in fat. I didn't attach the article, shoot, because I was rushing, but I did attach a research study where they showed a change in the gut microbiome by using more of a low-fat diet and a polyphenol-rich diet in a group of diabetics. So this research has been done, moving towards more of a, a high vegetable-based diet, low animal protein-based diet does seem to help diabetes. But there are many different ways to skin the cat. But keep in mind, in essence, the summary is that 
unequivocally, diabetes is a gut bacterial illness associated with excessive absorption of the pieces of bacteria, lipopolysaccharide. When that happens, we develop insulin resistance. When that happens through time, the longer we have insulin resistance, the more likely we are for our pancreas to finally burn out. And when it can't keep producing enough insulin to get the sugar from your food into the cells, then what happens? Ultimately, you're not able to control your blood sugar. You're not able to produce enough insulin. And as a consequence, you become diabetic. So keep in mind, we have this wave of 30% of the American population who's pre-diabetic. And within 10 to 20 years, most of them are going to become diabetic if they don't do something about it. So that is a major, major health concern in our country. And so please share this information. Talk to your loved ones about it because we're so indoctrinated. You know, it's, well, my blood sugar is still normal. I'm not diabetic yet and I don't need to be on a medication yet. And then once people become diabetic, then it's, well, I'm just on metformin or glyburide. I'm not on insulin yet. Or, you know, they have me on Genuvia and Invokana. I'm not, not on insulin yet. We need to fix the problem before we get to that point. And you can by correcting what you're eating through a structured process and getting rid of bad gut bacterial populations. So that's my take on it. That's my perception. I'm not saying that's the cure for everyone with diabetes, but for those who are really interested, that's what I think. Question, does alpha lipoic acid help? Helps marginally in my uh, experience, alpha lipoic acid, I haven't seen huge changes in diabetes, type two diabetes. And then question, so no corn and gluten for sure. Also, does berberine help lower blood sugar like they say? Yeah, the studies are pretty definitive that berberine does help to lower blood sugar, also helps to lower cholesterol in certain studies. Um, berberine, for example, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology, I believe, uh, 2014, berberine actually produced more live bursts than did metformin, a diabetes medication, for women who had infertility. And these women who had infertility had polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is where they develop cysts on their ovaries. And a primary driver for that is insulin resistance, prediabetes. And so they gave one group of these women berberine. Berberine is a natural plant alkaloid from a, a root that's largely growing in India. And so they gave one group berberine, and then they gave another group metformin. And the group receiving berberine had more live bursts than did the group with metformin. So that's pretty significant. Berberine is very, very powerful. So I think that's it. That's 20 minutes. So let me know what you think, any questions you have. Thanks all for watching. Uh, I'll be back Friday with another broadcast. Anything you want me to talk about, let me know. Okay.